85 degrees, it was very hot, and the door of my friend's clo uh, room was closed. It was packed, the room was dirty, and it didn't smell good. But he was in peace inside. He was, he was sleeping like an angel there. And whenever we came in and opened the door, the smell, that fragrance, came and hit us in the face. Pwah! And we will see him there very nicely just resting. And we said, can you feel the fragrance that is in this room? I said, no, there is nothing here. He had got accustomed to that fragrance in the room. And it didn't bother him anymore. It was a normal. Uh, it was normal for him. It was nothing to be clean or there was nothing to be organized because the fragrance that was in there became part of him. The, 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 the nostril, the, 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 the senses got accustomed to the, to the, to the, to the temperature in the room. Um, and there was no need to make any change. So other people will come in and when they open the door, the smell will come and hit them in the face. And they will say again, do you think that we have to do some cleaning in this room? And we say, there is nothing to clean in here. Everything is normal and everything is fine. That is the danger of getting accustomed to bad smells and odors and disorder. When we see it, we tolerate it, and we leave it, they become part of us and we see no longer anything wrong with it. Have you ever been in a room or in a place where somebody else comes in and say, can you smell that thing? And you say, what thing? If that's the case, you got accustomed to it already. And today, my brothers and sisters, we would like to take a look at a house in the Bible, very briefly, in chapter 12 of Matthew. You know this verse. There is a house there in Matthew chapter 12, in verse 44 that says that uh, chapter 12, 43, 44, and 45. Look at this house. Matthew 12, 43 says, When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walks through dry places seeking rest and he finds nothing. Then he says, I will return to my house from where I came out. And when he's come, he finds it empty, swept, and garnished, decorated. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. So there you have a house that is empty, that is clean, and it is nice, nicely decorated. And the demon says, well, I was cast out of there before by Jesus, but let me go back to the house. But he doesn't go alone. He gets seven demons worse than him, which tells me something that, if I don't sound offensive, we need to learn from the devil. And there is something about him. He knows the value of unity. The devil does not spend time fighting with his demons. There is too much people to kill out there for me to spend my time fighting with you. It is amazing that this demon, and I hope I don't sound irreverent again, shows some humbleness by acknowledging that there are some type of works that he cannot do alone. And he will not show off before Satan, telling him, no, boss, I will do it myself. No, he recognizes that in order to destroy that person, that lady, that gentleman, that child, that youth, that church, that family, he will not be able to do it alone. He recognizes his inability, and he recognizes that he will need the help of people that are stronger than him. We will have less division in some churches at the time of elections if some people were as humble as this demon. Wow. 
And in previous chapters, Jesus recognizes, no, no, no. If Satan is divided against Satan, he knows his kingdom will go down. Satan is united. If there is, they hate one another. They despise one another. But when it comes to destroy you, they get together. They put the differences aside in order to kill you. And here I am fighting with my brothers for something else. For, for, for meaningless things. But they recognize that. Somebody said that part-time Christians will not be able to defeat full-time demons. These spirits are the f oh, every single day in the gym. While I am with the control and fries. So he recognizes that and he says, this is too good for me to destroy it alone. This is too big for me to destroy it alone. And he then goes out and he gets... Seven demons worse than him, and then when he comes in, he sees the house that is nicely decorated and is clean and is empty. And they go in the house, the Bible says. They go in the house. Now, this is the scary part, because you can have a house that is clean, that is decorated, but full of demons. So there are many churches that can be clean, nicely decorated, but full of demons. There are many lives that may be clean, nicely decorated, but full of demons. And back in the days, as, uh, as the pastors have been expressing today, you know, demon possession will go all over the place, vomiting, sponge, and rolling their eyes and making noises. Not today. No, not today. The devil has seen and has adapted his, te his techniques to a modern society. So they will be cool, calm, collected, but full of demons. It's not enough, them, to have a clean house. It's not enough, them, to have a decorated house. Because even then, it can be full of demons. So, my brothers and sisters, the key, not only to evangelism out there, but also in my personal life is that besides having the, 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 the clean house and, and the decorated house, because that will not be enough, is to have the house full. And the only person that makes the house full is Jesus. When Jesus is in the house, the house is full. So he, they come in, and they say, this is our house now. And they do everything. But they crawl into places that are not easily seen. Because the house remains apparently clean and decorated. So they go under the carpet and behind the sofa, and places where we usually do not pass the vacuum, in those dark corners that you usually don't sweep and clean, this is where they are. So here I am, having a wonderful campaign, and a week of prayer, or a holy communion, and apparently everything is nice and clean. But after that week of campaign, of rejoicing and songs and prayer and all of that, the demons that are under the carpet come back to work. And the visitors that got accustomed to a loving atmosphere during that week suddenly are perplexed and confused because they say, this is not what I told, that I was told. This is not what I was shown during the previous week. Now reality comes back. And that is the problem because then the week of prayer or the Holy Communion or the campaign becomes a drama, a, 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 a circus, a, 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 a movie, a, a, a short skit, a break of war. But then when that is over, let's get back to reality. And this is then when they come out and the gossiping begins again. And the fighting begins again, begins again. Uh, and the competition begins again. And the elitism begins again. And the sexism begins again. Ra sexism, racism, and all the isms there come back rolling. Because they never gone. They were never gone. They stay there. They hide, but they stay there. And so when people see the reality, it says, I don't need this. I am bullied in my work. And I came here running away from bullying, but I'm being bullied here too. 
I run away from my neighborhood because they are eating my flesh alive, gossiping about me. And I came to this church, but they are eating myself here too. So I need to run from here. And they, they run again. Why? Because having rituals and ceremony is not enough. The house needs to be clean. In those corners that we don't want to touch. In these in this carpets that we don't want to lift because what is there is not nice. And we don't want to face it probably. But it is worth facing. When, when I look at the mirror, and instead of probably blaming Brother Johnson or Sister Mary, I look at the mirror and say, you, sir, have a problem, and we need to deal with it. You will, set, will be set free. You can spend your life blaming everybody else and say that it's this one's fault until that day when you recognize, I need to change. And I'll tell you one thing. When you change, even when things do not change around you, they change anyway. You change. They don't want to change, you change. They don't want to preach, you preach. They don't want to do, you do. In fact, I'll tell you something. It's something that I share with my members always. If probably those things that are making you angry and uncomfortable in your church are the things that God wants you to do. So if you are complaining about the whole being dirty, maybe God calls you to give you the ministry of sweeping. Hello. If you are com com uh, complaining about the choir singing bad, maybe God called you to join the choir and help. So those things that you see that you don't like probably are your ministry. Mahatma Gandhi said, Don, ask for a change. Be the change that you want to see in the world. So cleaning the house will demand self-inquiry. It will demand you to face yourself. It will demand me to face myself and say, enough is enough. My behavior, my attitude, and my words are obstructing God's work in this place. And I need to change. And I need to put my ego aside. And I need to put my flesh aside for the benefit of others. We are seeing the example of a demon that is capable of doing that. Because he knows that by recognizing that he cannot work alone, and by unifying himself and bringing unity between him and other demons, he knows that he will advance the cause of Satan. That's why he's doing it. And he puts differences aside. So my dear friends, yes, number one, it will demand self-inquiry. It will demand self-inquiry. It will take me to take a look at myself in the mirror and say, it's time to cut the curse. It has gone for too long. And it's time to say, enough is enough. Lord, change me. This is number one. Number two, there are people among us, probably, hopefully not, that have got accustomed to the fragrance of demons. They are there. You don't see them. But the smell has become part of us. And when you start cleaning the house, People that are accustomed to that fragrance will fight you. When you get accustomed to something, even though that thing is killing you, many times you don't want to let go. The Israelites in the desert, they were accustomed to being whipped and beaten. Remember that? They were crying in Exodus chapter 3, saying, Lord, when are you going to come? Set us free. And the Lord said, I have heard the mistreatment. That the, Israel, uh, that the Egyptians are doing on you, how they are whipping you, and your cry has come up all the way to me. They were being beaten and mistreated and stepped on, oppressed by the Pharaoh. When God takes them out of there to the desert and gives them a cloud and food and water, they complain. And they say, I wish we will go back. We remember the onions and the fish that we had in Egypt. But when I look at Exodus, I don't see no fish and no onions. All I see is a perpetual beating from Pharaoh. But they got accustomed to that. And there are people 
that are so accustomed to be ill-treated and mistreated that when you treat them well, they react against you. They like fighting. They like beating and being beaten. And being well-treated as a human being is an unknown experience for them. Many of these things begin when they were ch a child or they learn at home or other places. But that antagonism, that negativity has become so part of themselves that it's almost impossible to let go. And when you present a better option, they refuse and say, it's better to go back. They don't remember the weeping. They remember just a little bit of fish that Pharaoh gave them because they are accustomed. You can get accustomed to the smell. You can get accustomed to the beating and actually even justify the abuse on yourself and say, well, Pharaoh was not a bad man anyway. It's true that he smacked my head every now and then, but overall we did some, we have some good times making bricks without straw. You find yourself justifying evil because it has become so much assimilated in your system that you don't know anymore how to live without it. So there are people that do not know how to live without conflict. And when churches is at peace, they say, it is too peaceful in here. We need to do something in order to create a crisis. And they create the crisis. And when the fight takes home, take, takes place, now they feel at home. Because that's what home is, fighting and cursing and beating. And when the gospel comes in and says, well, we have a better life, we say, no, we don't want that one. That's probably one of the challenges that you might face when you try to clean the house. But I'll tell you one thing. Do not be afraid. The Lord is with you. And I will start by cleaning the house of my heart. By looking at the mirror and saying, Lord, it's time to get help. It's time to be open and clear. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2 that the church was so united and so together in one mind and loving one another and taking care of one another. So much so that the Bible says that God added to the church every day. He brought people to the church, the Bible says. There are some churches where God will not bring anybody because they will be lost. <laughs> they say, well, I cannot. I would like to take you. But I cannot take you there. But we, don't, we pray that our church is actually different and that the Lord will bring people to our church. The unity was such, my friends, my dear brothers and sisters, that the Lord, they came alone. They themselves said, do you know that there is a place here where you can worship in peace? Do you know that there is a place where they will receive you and welcome you and ask you, do you have any supper? Do you have any dinner? Would you like to eat with us? Where are you from? Sit with us. There is lunch after the service. Or would you like to go with me to my home? The Bible says these people were so well treated that they came alone to the church and they stayed there. Because my brothers and sisters, those things that are under the carpet are the things that as has been exposed already are kicking the people out. It's like a man that is in love with a woman. It could be a woman too, but let's say a man. A man that is in love with a woman, I give you teddy bears, and I give you chocolate, and I give you uh, flowers, and I take you to eat out there and over here until you marry me. Some of you are dating somebody today. That's not a real person. That is a representative. <laughs> when you are dating is, baby, can I, have a, can I have a glass of water? Just to quote Chris Talker. Can I have a glass of water? Of course, baby. Of course. Th oh, thank you, baby. No, 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 no. Thank you. She goes and gets the water and comes back. Is there anything else that I would like that you would like me to do for you? No, baby, it's fine. It's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Anything? Just let me know. Okay. After the honeymoon. <laughs> baby, can I have a glass of water? Who oh, you were talking to me? <laughs> Did you hear that, baby? I hear it was me. Yeah. 
everything changes. Or probably not. It was all along there. And sometimes we are like that in church. To attract. We have a good technique to attract, but a bad technique to retain. Because after the show, we take off the mask like, you know, Tom Cruise. There is a comedy of that. And they are making fun of MI 1 and 2 and 3. I think there are like 10 Mission Impossibles. And in this case, he has a mask. And he said, I have something to tell you. I am not the person you think I am. And he takes the mask and is himself again. <laughs> After the week of prayer, the campaign, we take the mask. Welcome to planet me. <laughs> and the visitors and new baptized members, they just locate the exit door <laughs> over there. They see tennis shoes, they see exit door, and they run for their life. So time for us then to tell Lord, my life is not mine, it's yours. Come in. Because the house can be clean, it can be decorated, but until he is not there, it's empty. I will tell you one thing, it might be painful to face yourself, but it's worth, you will be free. You will be a better you. You will have a better life. You will grow, you will mature. You, 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 these shackles will be broken. So it's time for us to say, Lord, this is not my church. It's you coming and take over everything. Sweep whatever you think that you know that needs to be swept. And even things that I don't want to get rid of, Lord, I give you permission to clean my house. Amen. Amen. Please come in and clean my church, my house, my heart. Make me a better person for you. Make me a better person for my family. Make me a better person for myself, for those who surround me. The Bible says that the house in Matthew is empty. And in Revelation, the house, he is outside in Revelation 2, knocking and calling. Must be desperate to get in. Because usually when I get home, I just knock. But you know that when you knock and call, uh, the, last team, the last time I saw somebody knocking and calling desperately was Alfred from the Flintstones. Desperate to get in. When the Bible says that he is knocking and calling, it's because he's desperate to get in. Will you open the door today? Will you say, yes, Lord, come in. You have been there for so long, so humbly waiting, patiently waiting. Snow and rain, dark and light, heat and cold, still there, faithfully knocking and calling. And it's time for us to open and give the house over to him. What do you say about, what do you say about that? Amen? Amen? Let's give him the house to him. Let's give him permission to clean even the darkest corners of our hearts. One day you will say, thank you, Lord. I'm happy I did. Is there anybody that would like to do that? Amen. That renew your covenant with the Lord and say, Lord, there are some corners I need you to clean. I need that too. This is not for you. This is for me. I need him to clean many corners of my house. I want to open the door and give him the keys. For him to get rid of things that are not easily seen. For him to get rid of things that are there since our childhood. For him to get rid of things that we have got accustomed to and we no longer see as bad. For him to put things right. For him to enlighten us and guide us. Father, we thank you for the word that has been shared for my brothers, and my brother and colleagues, pastors, Lord and for the invitation. Lord, as we speak of evangelism, we want to start with ourselves, asking you to clean our house. We give it over to you, and we thank you, Lord, for your humbleness and insistence and persistence, for not giving up. Today, we want to renew our covenant with you and to give you permission so you can put things right in our lives. Light a candle in this dark house 
and show us the way that we need to follow. In such a way, Father, that when others come to our churches, they want to stay. They do not want to go. Thank you for hearing our prayers, Lord. Reshape us, clean us, reform us. And we thank you for your forgiveness and mercy and patience with us. It is in the name of Jesus that we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Amen.